Welcome to the dark side of the moon, everybody. Welcome back to Techno Social. It's been a little hiatus, I think, since we've had some outside guests, but things are coming back now. And well, there's lots to come. I won't say any more than that in the in the short run. But today we've got three guests. Alexander Bard, who's been with us several times before. People <laughs> will know him. We've got Zachary Adama and we've got Shoheen. I've uh, forgotten your surname, Shaheen, unfortunately, and you've not got it written on Zoom. So you're just going to be known as Shaheen, the Shaheen, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and the topic of conversation today, which Alexander is going to tell us a little bit more about, because it's uh, it's a little brainchild of his, this four-way uh, little thing that he's been dreaming up, was going to be psychedelics and the psychedelic superpowers, um, which you can say a little bit more about. Um, welcome, everybody. I think this is going to be fun. I think it's going to be very shamanic more than anything here. So I, if you started the world map and then you look at the history of psychedelics, you will discover that, you know, most of the planet actually has a very sort of sober, you know, possibility of doing psychedelics because the plants you've got available, like in Europe, China, India, even Africa, it's kind of, it's kind of poor, right? But there are three golden places historically where you find so many different plants that you can have fun with that these places deserve to be called the three historical psychedelic superpowers. And the three places are Peru and Mexico. We all know that the Americas completely changed the map of psychedelics. But there was a superpower in the old world as well before that, which is Iran and Central Asia. And I've been dreaming about having this conversation for years because I've been looking out to see if I can find a couple of shamans that could represent these different cultures. And when I run into Zachary and knowing his experience from Peru and Mexico, Zachary is from Kentucky in the States originally, but does pilgrimages to Peru and Mexico and you know knows everything about the plants and the different active ingredients and things. And then we got Shuhin here who runs a Persian cultural festival in Canada, been running it for years, but he's also doing a psychedelic startup in San Francisco. And he's an expert and like me, he's wild and crazy about Zoroastrianism and, and about drinking the Haoma and going to find the ritual drinks of Iran and Central Asia. So when I found these two guys and they don't know each other beforehand, I thought it'd be wonderful that this kind of virgin conversation between these guys and get, you know, all the shamanic Jews out of them. So, um, so I'd like, I'd like to introduce you guys. I, I want to start with Shoheen, since you have got such a great first name that you're like Prince or something like that. People don't even know your last name. You're just Shoheen. Etnam, I would say, but Shoheen. We'll call you Shoheen from now on. So why don't you tell us about your story and your background and why you arrived at this interest in psychedelics? Absolutely. Uh, Owen, Alexander, thanks so much for, for inviting me to this podcast. And it's great to meet you, Zachary. Uh, here, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, so the journey started from um, getting into uh, studying plants and the plants that have psychoactive uh, effects on our mind and, and also some neurophysiological uh, benefits you know, for our wellness. Um, so I started with, uh, I'm a chemical engineering by a chemical engineer by training, a PhD in chemical engineering. I work with different industry, but back in 2018, I landed on a uh, startup company that the idea was building an extraction system for extraction of psychoactive alkaloids from different plants. And, and with that, I, my journey took me to cannabis and very quickly with this psychedelic renaissance uh, and being in Vancouver at the same time, um, I kind of got into uh, studying the psychoactive and psychedelic mushrooms, um, looking into psilocybin specifically. And then from psilocybin, this whole journey uh, went forward in, into the world of ethnopharmacology and ethnobotany which is a relation with, between how our brain and people you know, evolved through the time versus you know, the neuro, neurochemical uh, interjection you know, from, from the plants that they had over time in their regions. So yeah, I can say that um, basically my journey has taken me to where I'm going, but the fascination about Iran actually came from the fact that I realized and learned that in the Iranian old religion pantheon, we had psychoactive compounds that 
um, was dedicated mostly to the castes of elites. And then they were taking those to have uh, otherworldly journeys and to have access to the, to the life after death. And, um, and, and then that was, you know, that embarked me on a journey into studying some of the ancient texts and specifically the definition of subjective experiences that is very well defined in these old, old Zoroastrian, uh, texts. And, um, yeah, and that's where I am today, you know, just kind of, um, mixing from chemistry, pharmacology, history, and, um, and also some understanding about subjective, you know, effects and experiences, shamanism, and I'm learning every day. So let me just ask an, uh, an additional question. We've all heard about the Indian Soma. Uh, actually, India is kind of weak when it comes to what yogis can use. You've got opium, you've got uh, cannabis, obviously, and you've got mushrooms. You've got mushrooms everywhere in the world, by the way, and you almost find hemp just about everywhere in any climate zone or whatever. They're widespread. But when it comes to Central Asia, Russian archaeologists have discovered in Turkmenistan, which is, you know, very Persian, Central Asia, they discovered in Turkmenistan remnants from antiquity where over nine different compounds were used at the same time in the same ritual drink. They just simply find a piece of clay and they discover the nine different psychoactive compounds, and not three. And, and I'm, I'm interested in that so we can launch this term, the, the Persian term, the Zoroastrian term is haoma. So we make a difference here between soma and haoma. The, the procedures are obviously similar, but what is what is your understanding of how the home is different in the in the sense that you you can discover so many different compounds coming from Central Asia? I understand you can even make ayahuasca literally out of ingredients only coming from, say, Afghanistan. So Central Asia is is in this sense a, a, as golden as Peru and Mexico almost. What what is your experience when you studied psychoactive substances, and what is your theory of what the home would have consisted of? <laughs> Uh, well, Homa is Homa and Soma is actually they are coming from the same same word. It's just there are different um, pronunciation from Sanskrit to Old Avestan, which was the ancient you know language in Iran before today's Farsi, and before that there was Pahlavi, and then we had the Old Avestan language, which was the language of Gotha and the language that was used in the bacteria area and in the ancient Iran. Um, so the word, the, the terminology means to press out. So it was a process of pressing out the active compounds of a mixture. So there have been research about the botanical identity of Soma and Homa and, you know, even referrals into some of the ancient texts about, let's say there were tweaks of the yellow color, et cetera. But we don't know if it was necessarily one plant. Soma and homo means to press out, which means that it was an extract. And um, and even though we think that like they could be the same thing, you know, my realization is that based on different flora in Iran and India, even like in different regions, soma and homo was that psychoactive, you know, blend or that was just a very intentional. Uh, psychedelic, heavily hallucinogenic compound, like a, a mixture of compounds that was putting together intentionally by a cast of priests, you know, or people who knew exactly what they were mixing for different, you know, ceremonies. And based on that, they were mixing from the plants of that region. So the, the flora of Iran, especially northeast of Iran, is very different from the flora of India. And um, that is why I believe that they were using very different plants as soma. They were like they were mixing different plants as soma versus what was what it was as homa. But the the fact that my focus also is on on homa is that like the time that the the Rig Veda, which was which is the referral of most of you know the information that comes about soma. Uh, the time that Rig Veda was transcribed from an oral you know poetry that was you know basically being trans, you know, formed from one generation to the another generation is about a thousand years older than Avesta. So Avesta is, is way newer, you know, when it got transcribed. And as a result, they, they think that because of this thousand year difference, you know, like it, it, it was more 
accurate in terms of the information that was documented as part of, uh, you know, basically the old Avestan text versus the Rig Veda. So the Rig Veda is kind of very metaphorical. It just it combines, let's say, from a DD definition of soma, it goes all the way to an extract, and it goes to, you know, it, it has different definition. It becomes a like kind of like a holy water, you know, which again is referred to as soma. It becomes you no know, bulls, um, you know, basically uh p or you know uh that is also like there are different referrals to 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 soma but when it comes to the iranian pent like old religion pantheon the there are the, the the referrals are much more accurate so there are the definitions even the subjective experience that is referred to the effect of the homo they are more consistent i can say and as a result, you know, like um, basically I focus most of my studies on Homa, even though like they are like basically the people of that region are were the same people. They were separated later on. But um, Soma and Homa probably was the same thing, exactly like Hindu and Sindhu, like which the, the pronunciation is different. It was different in different region. But um, but again, when it comes to pharmacology and the subjective experience of Homa, it was coming from a land which was more dry and, you know, like kind of like it were like how the northeast of Iran was. And as a result, you, we can kind of um, like go through and, you know, basically um, just, uh, you know, shortlist of, of some of those, you know, plant sources that could be used in this you know uh, mixture and what they were using we were using you know even ritually we we're using pestle and mortar to press this out and they were just washing it multiple times which they're all you know from a chemical engineering perspective this is kind of like a very complex mass transfer of you know just getting you know different active compounds into one of the aqueous phases and at the end it was an aqueous phase which was like a liquid phase which you know the the priest, you know, was the one priest was providing it to the other priest and the other priest was drinking it. And then they was embarked on this, you know, psychoactive journey. Great. And we should add here that, you know, in the Western tradition, Christianity and Islam have obviously banned people from having fun, basically. And we should say that Shaivism in India and Zoroastrianism in Iran always promoted the use of these drinks, not in general, but certainly by the priesthood. And by the shamans, there's even a great Iranian, old Iranian word for shaman called Zautar, which I love, which is different from Mobit. Mobit is priest and Zautar is shaman. So these traditions knew what they were doing. This was this was an integrated part of their culture. And then I want to go over to Zachary. I'm just dying to hear what Zachary's got to say, because I just saw this fantastic documentary about the Nazca people in Peru the other day. You know, you heard about these enormous signs you can see when you fly with flights over 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 central Peru that people didn't see until they had airplanes. Mm -hmm. And people were building these geoglyphs, like huge buildings, these geoglyphs, like you could see from outer space these different characters and things. And people have been fascinated with the Nazca mm -hmm. culture for the last 50 to 60 years. And now they've discovered they built huge temples first before they built these geoglyphs. And of course, they were drinking ritual drinks. So I want to pass it over to Sakari, since you do pilgrimage to Peru and guide people with these experiences. What is your theory of what people were drinking in Peru 2,500 years ago? They were drinking a lot of different things, you know. Um, in, in my lineage of Wachuma under Don Howard and and one of his and one of my principal teachers right now is one of his uh, successors, Don Martin, uh, indigenous man. Lives in Shavin in Peru and by the, the temple there. Uh, grew up in the temple. And that temple uh, ha has the last and only God of the Americas still in its original place, the land zone. It's been there in the same place for over 3,000 years. And they were drinking Wachuma, but they were also located three miles or three days walk from the coast and three uh, and three days walk from the jungle. They were a meeting place of all these different medicines. They were a meeting place of all these different cultures. So they were they were working with these sacred plant teachers. And, you know, 
there's different ways to harmonize the energy field of people, places, things, cultures, you know, and some of them are more sophisticated than others. These cultures, in my opinion, were using these sacred medicines to learn from the earth. They were using these sacred medicines as a tool, as a vehicle, as a means to accelerate the evolution of consciousness. They were tapping into truth in a very deep way. They were listening to truth in a very deep way. And in my opinion, these cultures sprang out of the consciousness of the medicines. These cultures sprang out of that consciousness. Wachuma, ayahuasca, vilca, you know, they go into the jungle and there's all sorts of medicines everywhere. Medicines for purification, medicines for healing, medicines for learning. And the master teacher healer plants, wachuma, ayahuasca, and even tobacco, right? So they're working with all these medicines to purify themselves, heal themselves, and ultimately learn and allow the great, great mother to teach them, to teach them how to be human and how to be divine and how to merge spirit and form. So how did a kid from Kentucky end up in Peru knowing all these things? you got to tell us your story, Zachary. Well, you know, Don Howard was also from Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, we should say, we, we're talking about Don Howard. If, you, if you've seen Aubrey Marcus' podcast, yeah. he talks about Don Howard like the most fantastic person he ever met. We are both, we are both, we owe everything to Don Howard here. Don Howard Lawler was an American anthropologist who settled in the jungle with the Shikibo people on the border between Colombia and Peru and Brazil. And he learned to know them very carefully for many, many years, learned their languages and everything. And then he became a uh, Wachumir and Ayasquare himself. He became an appointed shaman. And I, I guess both you and I, Zachary, learned what we know today. We learned it basically from Don Howard. It started with yeah. Don Howard. And he, he there's a place called Spirit Quest outside of Quitos where he's actually, I think his daughter now is running it. Yes. Uh, they're trying to rebuild it after the, the havoc the corona pandemic caused in yeah. Peru. But but it's a fantastic place. And it's also one of the few places in the world you can go and actually experience both Wachuma, which is the San Pedro cactus, and you can experience the ayahuasca in different programs mm -hmm. in the very same place. So why don't you tell us about your relationship with Don Howard, Zachary, and how you got so informed? As you My were. relationship with Don Howard is interesting in that I have come to know him after he left his body. Um, I. You know, I I spent a decade uh, on the spiritual path as a devout Kriya Yogi, you know, and doing my 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 pranayama, my meditation, my my constructive lifestyle, my study, my self inquiry, you know, all though that 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 practice of of, of spiritual um, self cultivation through through that disciplined approach, and then it was truly a prayer to deepen my capacity to be a healer. That led me to plant medicines. You know, I, I had this uh, beautiful friend. We would meditate together at his his cabin, you know, once or twice a month in the woods that he had built himself. And he was really into plant medicines, and he was a student of Don Howard's. And, you know, one time he invited me to have a mushroom ceremony one time instead of meditating. And so there in, in the summer of 2019, we, uh, instead of meditation, we went by the creek, had some beautiful golden teacher mushrooms that he grew himself, put a lot of love into. 3.5 grams later, blew my doors wide open and I fell in love. And, um, and you know, that was just one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Just, you know, you know, literally communing with, with Jesus Christ, with Mother Mary, not to mention the star nations and all these other things and these deities. And, and towards the end of that journey, there was this golden tantric goddess that came to me. And she said, go to Peru and work with ayahuasca. And you know, I, when I get a message like that, I obey. Next week, I applied to go down there to Spirit Quest. It was before Don Howard left his body, almost three months to be exact. I, I arrived at Spirit Quest in January 2020, three months after he left his body. And that's where I met our, our our friend, our mutual friend and brother Parker Sherry, who was uh, who picked up the torch and was facilitating down there at Spirit Quest after Don Howard passed. And I had the you know beautiful initiation with ayahuasca, which was a true homecoming. 
And I, I, I literally got drafted. For lack of a better word, she said, you know, you've been a devotee to me for many lifetimes. And this is an opportunity to renew that commitment should you choose to walk the path. And I said, hell yes. And I also got to work with Wachuma, poured by his, uh, Don Howard's daughter, Selva. Incredible, beautiful experience. Uh, uh, just this instant merger of consciousness. Just this instant merger of consciousness and the colonization of my body. And towards the end of that first Mesa, they had this beautiful um, altar to Don Howard over in the corner, a beautiful picture of him in a white shirt. And, you know, I didn't know much about Don Howard. I watched some videos and things. I thought, oh, he's a beautiful man. You know, he's got a lot of wisdom, a true elder. And one of our uh, brother went over there who had, who had studied with Don Howard for a long time, sat with him many times. He went over and knelt down in front of that altar, was just praying. And all of a sudden, this energy came into the room of this spine made of steel and this warrior's heart that was just beating in service to life. Just this radiant, strong heart and this spine made of steel. And it was Don Howard. And our brother, he started crying, said, Maestro, I thought that you had retired. <laughs> but uh, there's no retiring for a shaman. No, I tell you what Don Howard did to me. He took me down there on the Wachuma <laughs> and the game of the Vikra. <laughs> and I died and I returned to life again in the next, you know, the next hour or so. Yeah. And he'd put all these skulls of shaman on a table. So it was just like not only him, but there were all the shamans were in the room. Yeah. There all the skulls were in the room. It 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 was alive, you know. Yeah. It, you could always argue whether you're poetic or you describe it, but you undeniably have this exact experience. That's yeah. the way I would describe it. And I love the way you use your language so poetically when you describe it, because that's the way to describe an experience like that. It, yeah. it, 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 we can use science, like Shohin does, obviously, and we have to use it to understand the start of the molecules and try to understand the compounds. And if you're going to introduce these cultures into a very confused Western culture today mm -hmm. and, and have a successful you know, meeting rather than a clash between the cultures. I think it's necessary both to have a language of the logos, which is very scientifically correct, but also what I call to have a language of the pathos, which you incredibly well have, Sakri, in the way you describe the experience with the words that actually catch us the experience. Owen, you're a bit of a virgin when it comes to these things. I still want to hear what, what you've been at with psychedelics since you're the virgin dragged into the room of three professionals here. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, uh, I'm having a lot of fun, boys. Um, I guess for me, the first experience I had, right, was I, I got invited to this, this Cytrons party up in the Welsh mountains about, it would be about nine, 10 years ago. And um, up to that point, I'd really just been a heavy metal party boy, just pumping myself with MDMA <laughs> and cocaine mainly and Very drinking sweet. and uh, and a lot of weed. Um, but at this party, basically I overdid it on a dosage of MDMA, blacked out, and then come to with a tab of LSD in my mouth and this beautiful hippie girl also with a tab of acid in her mouth going, well, we're locked in now. And wonderful trip in the mountains, mists, just dancing, me just going, what the fuck is this fucking thing? What is going on? And she remained, still is really a very close friend of mine for several years. I really feel like that this girl initiated me into, into something that, that I hadn't really tasted before. And then after then, trip to various few times in quite recreational ways. So taking acid, taking shrooms. Um, and then honestly, in the last few years, I haven't really been so, um, so close to it. And maybe there's something to explore here because I think for me, I was taking psychedelics in a very just experimental recreational party oriented way. And then I stepped away from where I was a student and then started to explore, I guess, my own path with yoga and then moving more into Western occultism, Western esotericism. And now there's much more of a sense of, okay, next time I do psychedelics, I want to do it to try and have a, um, a religious experience, you might say, as opposed to doing it 
for partying. And I haven't actually found myself in the right context for it yet. So I've been sitting basically and waiting, knowing that this, this, this journey is going to happen when the right time arises, but not feeling the pressure to force it really. And kind of just, it'll come. And I know when the signs will be there basically. So that's, that's more or less where I think I'm at at the moment, but I do find that I've got several friends, Alexander and many others who are very deeply in this psychedelic world. Um, So I, I get to sit on the edge of it and have fun and be a poet on the outside. Well, the thing is, if I'm the bridge between these two different traditions, is that all shamans I met, it doesn't matter if it's Central Asia or South America, it doesn't matter at all. They've always agreed that you have to have the proper intention first. And if the proper intention isn't there, you're not going through with the ceremony. So after the intention comes the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And after the ceremony, the most important aspect of the whole thing is the integration. And most shamans teach you very early on that you shouldn't overrate the experience itself because it is the integration of the experience, who you become, who you transformed into, which is key. And this seems to be universal. I nobody's done psychedelics properly and know what they're doing. And you also know the risk taking involved And you know, uh, w- w- they would all agree on this, that the intention before and the integration after the ceremony, absolute key. And it sounds from your experience uh, here, Owen, that you're typical, like a Western club kid who's the drugs are around. Uh, they're criminal, but nobody cares. And you get them and you throw them into your mouth. And actually, that's why we have these accidents all the time, because the intention isn't there. The kids don't know what they're doing. And, and this is the problem, not the criminalization, which is deeply problematic. When people here in Scandinavia, I, you know, I, I'm politically involved in these issues here. And people there in Scandinavia want to discuss drugs. They say that, well, we can't we can't let the drugs free. And I'm saying that's exactly what we're doing with criminalization. With criminalization, we have no clue what's going on. We're putting it over into the black economy and the dark side of society. We get the drug dealers and all that. And we have no idea what we're taking. And we're throwing it into our mouths and we freak each other out. And we have problems constantly with people who get have very traumatic experiences. I mean, Sacra here just described a fantastic experience from Peru because it was controlled and he was there with proper shamans and he became a shaman himself because of it. But if you just throw drugs into your mouth and mix them, especially if you mix them with alcohol, you mm. obviously get problems. So I'd like to I'd like to talk to Sacra and Shaheen here in what way you discovered the sincerity in having the intention before and the integration afterwards before you do psychedelics. Zachary, do you want to pick up on that one? Sure. And I've been, I've, I've always been a little bit uh, devout. <laughs> I, ha- I have this, uh, this Kriya Yogi purity Brahmin thing about me, right? From has to come from prior lifetimes. I don't drink alcohol. I don't even take aspirin. You know, I, I don't, I don't really don't do synthetics. If, if, if I want as natural as possible, right? I, 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 you know, for that, for me, that's reverence for the great mother. That's reverence for Pachamama. Um, so I've always had a devout orientation. You know, I, when I was a kid, I wanted to run off to the monastery and be a monk, right? Like I've just always had this drive. I want, I want to be one with the creator. I want to, I want to throw myself in the flame and and burn away everything that's not true, you know, and until I'm just one with the creator. So I've always had this orientation all my life. And, and and so going down there to Peru and working with with these incredible, incredible maestros, these incredible healers, these incredibly evolved spiritual beings, uh, was just the a prayer answered. It was just like the revelation of my life's work, the revelation of my life's path. It was a prayer answered. And what these medicines have done and continue to do is teach me how to pray. They teach me how to pray with a pure heart for the good of all. And the process of working with the medicines continues to purify me in mind, body, and soul, continues to purify my desires, continues to purify my heart, continues to root out any weakness within me that flinches away from the truth, that flinches away from reality, that doesn't want to be present, wants to be selfish. 
So my experience with these medicines has been just that. It, it began with a prayer. And the medicine continues to teach me how to pray well. Shohin, isn't it striking here when Zachary is talking how much he sounds like a Sufi? <laughs> <laughs> I've been called that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, Sufism is way older than Islam. When it's when it's put, when it's it's got an Islamic umbrella, which both Sufis yeah. and Muslims actually disagree with. Sufism is, is more like in the Middle East. Sufism is the in Middle East and Pakistan, I should say. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's the equivalent of the yogis in India. It's something yeah. we do not have in Christian Europe at all. We basically got rid of it because it was called Dionysianism, most Dionysian mm -hmm. cults, which Owen loves, of course, but during the Greeks. But Christianity yeah. wiped it out of the West, and that's why we live in such poverty, spiritual yeah. poverty and psychedelic poverty more than anything. But what it comes, Shohin, what is your experience of Sufism, especially the pre-Islamic version of it? Because that's I'm I'm a Zoroastrian Sufi myself. So I'd like to hear your take on that. Because Zachary sounds like a Sufi here. Sounds <laughs> like a Sufi. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the path is the same path, right? It doesn't really matter you know, what what angle we are coming to. It's just like the path to the truth. If we if our compass, you know, if we check from outside, if the compass shows the right way, you know, if that is that's the way, you know, prayer, definitely meditation, and all these tools, psychedelics included are our tools in the way that we we find the path to the truth and and this is only the conscious part and there are so many unconscious contributions you know that holds us along the way to um to to basically to crave for understanding more to understand like who we are and why we are here for and and um and yeah, just like the, this, this experience of unity with something that is like basically just all encompassing, that is holding us all together. Um, you know, as I'm learning more about all these, like living in the West, you know, for about half of my life and then com be coming from the East, you know, which has all these complexes that it takes you probably like a few decades to even like penetrate through to the gist of like what is Sufism or what is Zoroastrianism and where, uh, or even like when it comes even to, you know, let's say some of uh, the practices from the Mesoamerica, you know, the, the use of uh, plant medicine. So there is this, at the end, there is this philosophy around capturing and become part of and basically become that, piece of dust you know as as part of a bigger bigger consciousness which um you know when i was a kid i learned that about for example ahura mazda in the zoroastrian pantheon and you always think that ahura mazda is this god that they teach you is the god which is like the highest wisdom but but now and my understanding as i go through is that ahura mazda is the pure consciousness is the highest wisdom it is the today's definition of consciousness, which is very advanced, modern, and and it's not it's only just one of the triad of Zoroastrianism. And then when you go to the next, and that is where my fascination actually comes from, that the other pillars of Zoroastrianism again they are so advanced in terms of um, the, the they are just they are the good mind and there are the mist the, the path to mysticism or Asha, which the good mind is, is truly the mental health. It's just like if we are using psychedelics today in a medicalized way, you know, the way that there is always at least, you know, the way that the, the, the society wants to bring it under a control, you know, to contribute into people's wellness, to get them out of their, you know, generational and contemporary traumas, um, so that is where we had this definition of the good mind. The good mind is the mind that is helping you to have the good deeds, good thoughts, and good words. And that, that is the mind that is free from any traumas. It's, it has a mind that has become one with the oneness. And, you know, and then that, that's the, the, that's the state of clarity that if you're not holding back all these baggages, from the past that is kind of imprinted on your biology, but it allows you to go forward much like lighter and then hold with you your presence, your, your experience of like this moment and then like, and then live the future at every moment as this present moment. 
And then the third part, which part of this basically pillar of the Zoroastrianism pantheon is actually the definition of Asha, which Asha itself is a very complex definition. But as I'm learning more specifically by learning from, you know, the, the philosophy of Jung, this is kind of like this very subtle definition of how the order of the events in your life come in sequence out of our conscious control. Basically, this is where we are indulging ourselves into the realm of fully unknown. It's just the whole unconscious, but finding a pattern, finding an order that this is the order to the truth. This is different from any other, you know, like, you know, basically just sequence of events that can happen that takes you to a destination a destination this is this is the real order to the truth so you follow the order to the truth and it has to be in co-creation with the unknown it has to be in co-creation with the realm of the you know unconscious so whatever we do you know from several of the psychedelics specifically the tryptamine based psychedelics this is based on my understanding of uh, psychopharmacology this is kind of like only gives us the access to, first of all, to different part of our brain first, like the part of our learning, which is potentiated under a kind of like simultaneous and instantaneous firing of our neurons. And that allows us to be able to think about its subject from a different, from different perspective, from different angle. And that is one level of epiphanies and breakthroughs that we receive. And then, then we dive deeper into our subconscious where the traumas come, where the shadows exist, where we have no control of like many of the learnings that we have had through the childhood until today, but we have gained those. But there are also like, then we come to the psychedelics or, um, you know, basically onerophernics, I would say. Onerophernics are what puts you in a dreamy state. It's not necessarily psychedelic. It is a psychoactive, but it gives you this access to the realm of pathing through, you know, from the conscious to the unconscious. And that is where we actually get dived into what we have no idea what is about. This is where, this is the fully on un, the full unknown. This is the whole, this is where the, the hero's journey starts. This is where you are just jumping over the unknown to the unknown. And then you trust the unknown. And then you look for the helpers and shamans and like the signs to be able to pass, to go through your past. So, um, yeah, I guess I believe that at the end of the day, basically the path to the truth is, is understanding these tools that like holds you consciously and unconsciously in this whole world of consciousness, which is endless, which is inf infinite. And then just always looking for those, uh, you know, um, guiding stars to be able to, you know, basically walk through the path and then always see yourself from the outside to understand that if, if the truth that you think is the truth, if the, is it the right truth or not, because you can always just get into, you know, like the false, um, you know, spirituality or like the definition or the, you know, the bypassing, you know, but the way to understand or at least you know, to have that compass is always to check ourselves and to see that like you know just, just to witness ourselves from outside in a way that we understand if this is a shadow that we are projecting on, on the rest of the world and ourselves or this is actually the real truth the real indulgence into something that is bigger than us and prayer meditation whirling um you know, like psychedelics, and these are all the tools that um, that helps us to go through the path. Great. Uh, we should we should we should remind each other here that the terms yoga and tantra and meditation, as we use them today, comes from Shaivism in India. Uh -huh. And with Shaivism in India, and and Zoroastrianism in Iran, and the Peruvian and Mexican ancient religions have in common, is that they're all monist or non-dual religions. Mm -hmm. So what Zachary described here, when he beautifully described his experience, when Don Howard's spirit was there as well, and he was there obviously with our dear friend Parker in, in the jungle in the Amazonas and had his ayahuasca experience, was this experience of unity, how everything is connected with everything else. And maybe this can explain why we had such a problem in Christian and Muslim culture with these things. So why 
psychedelics have been banned. Muslims don't need, are need, not even allowed to drink wine, for God's sake. So, so this banning obviously goes with dualistic religions where body and mind are separated. And, and uh, I agree totally. I mean, the first experience I got from psychedelics was this intense experience of unity. I wasn't alone. I, I was connected with everything else and everything around me was connected. It was just, it was just this enormous sense of multitude within one whole. Uh, and I became a spinocist, obviously, in that sense, because you know, everything is connected with everything else. And, and the thing about the world is really that there's so much of everything, but it's one world. It's all connected. So, Zachary, you've obviously been to Shavin de Huta. We, we, Huta we, we should say Shavin de Huta is this beautiful ancient place in northern Peru where people go and experience Shavin culture. Shavin culture was the longest peaceful culture ever in human history. For hundreds of years, Northern Peru was at peace. It was ruled by priests, obviously to tons of psychedelics. And it worked. <laughs> it worked, which is like the <laughs> ultimate horror for a Christian and Muslim to discover that the longest period of peace we ever experienced in human history was in Northern Peru for hundreds of years. And it was Shavin culture. What was your experience of coming to Shavin Hotar, uh, 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 Zachary, when you when you came there? Because you, you always- coming home. You, yeah, you obviously even do pil- Why don't you talk about your pilgrimages? You take yeah. them. Places. We, we right. do pilgrimages to to uh, Peru, and it is uh, it is the the pilgrimage engineered by Don Howard. You know, fifteen days you go to seven sacred sites that he he found, discovered, identified, and he he led pilgrimages um, to those sites for about twenty years. And uh, and Parker and I felt called to make the pilgrimage and bring friends. Uh, after he passed in working with, uh, with Don Martin, who was, who is, uh, uh, one of, one of Don Howard's chief successors. Yeah. We should add here that Parker Sherry is a dear, dear shared friend, but we lost him. He, yeah. he, 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 he just, he just got through an accident. I think was that in Utah, right? No, it was in uh, Austin, Texas. It was Austin, Texas. Yeah. It was an, it was just an accident. Just the way you lose a friend, a stunning guy, a young guy. He was uh, actually appointed by Don Howard to inherit whatever Don Howard had created. We both loved Parker to death, and it's a great loss for both me and Sacris. I just want to point that out when we talk about Parker here. We lost him simply in an accident, nothing else. Yeah. Okay, there you go. And uh, But th- that pilgrimage has become my biggest teacher. You know, we, we, start, uh, we start in Chiclayo by the coast. And we go to the Takume Pyramids, we go to the Palmac Forest, we go to El Brujo um, and have ceremony there and going into the lower world. And it really reflects the lower three chakras in many ways, the root chakra, the sacral chakra, and the solar plexus at El Brujo. And from there, we go up to Shavin, which is the center. It's the heart. We have our ceremony there the Shavin Temple. And you go, and I've been to that, I've been on this pilgrimage twice now, and I'll be going back hopefully in July, uh, July 1st to 15th and taking a group. That the land zone at the center of that temple has this beautiful smiling jaguar on it. And it has it's this erect stone. It means it, Taitawanka is what it's called in Quechua, which means erect stone, which looks like the Shiva Lingam. In, 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 in a lot of ways, right? So it's like this, this antenna of cosmic consciousness. And when you connect with that land zone, working with the sacred medicine, you are connecting to an antenna that is an antenna for infinite love and infinite bliss. And it is an antenna, a multidimensional antenna for universal knowledge and wisdom. Every time I have connected with that land zone, I have received such a huge download into my being that I spend months and months unpacking it. It shifts my being completely every time. And it is um, it, it is the most profound spiritual practice I've ever engaged in. And, you know, so we do that at Shavin, <laughs> the most profound spiritual practice you can imagine, you know, connecting with the land zone and this antenna for infinite love, infinite bliss, and cosmic wisdom. And then we go up into the upper world. We go up to high altitude lagoons. We go to this incredible rock forest where that's these, it's about 15,000 feet above sea level. And it's the biggest star deck you can imagine. 
You know, it, it's these 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 quartz rocks everywhere that have been shaped by nature in, into all these different figures. And my perception is that these are anchoring points of cosmic consciousness, of archetypal consciousness into the earth grid for all sorts of things, like an, all the animal kingdoms, all the plant kingdoms, like the consciousness is anchoring there into the earth. And, you know, there's paintings, there's 10,000 year old paintings, cave paintings. Uh, there, there's, there's paintings of the star people there that you can see and connect with. I mean, it's just the most incredible experience. And then we go to Heaven's Gate, this beautiful high altitude lagoon. It's about 15,000 feet above sea level. This beautiful crystalline lagoon between two uh, snow, snow-capped mountains. And the energy of that place is truly heaven on earth. It is love, infinite love and infinite bliss. I start inv- involuntarily singing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Ar, every time I'm there. And the medicine helps you, you know, what, what Chuma does is it helps you attune to the energy, the vibration of your environment. That's why setting is so important with Wachuma, because it helps bring you into resonance and connect with the energy of your environment. So when we take you in a body to heaven on earth and give you Wachuma, we give you the opportunity to attune to the vibration of heaven on earth, which is infinite love and infinite bliss. And in the process, everything in you that's not heavenly is going to come up and going to come out. And that's that's the healing of it. It's healing through beauty and awe. Right? In a completely conscious, lucid state. Not like with ayahuasca when you're in the dark and you you don't, it's hard to integrate the experience of infinity with this finite body for most people. Right? Their inner their energy field is not intelligent enough to integrate the experience for most people. With Wachuma, you're in the body, you're in a lucid state, a super conscious state, because you're more present than you've ever been in your life. And you're attuning to the vibration of heaven on earth. So that was the the pilgrimage that Don Howard engineered. And it is the most incredible spiritual practice I've ever engaged in. And, you know, as long as I'm in a body, I, I will lead pilgrimages down there for as long as I can and take people to have that experience because... Without a doubt, without failure, the people I, we've taken on that pilgrimage have their life dramatically changed for the good. I should add here that if you do take the Wachuma, you walk out into nature, you had no idea what nature was before you do that. Absolutely. The, the, the amount of details you, 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 uh, you can't describe the words. You're blind. You, you, use, you use great words, Zachary, because you're so poetic, but it's hard to describe your words, the intense experience, but suddenly you see a jungle or suddenly you see a mountain. You, you, you yeah. haven't seen it before. That's, that's a stunning experience. And, and then also this intense feeling of wholeness, of, of belonging, of, of being part of all this and just being united and not separated from the world any longer. Yeah, and, you're coming and, into true relationship with reality. Yeah, I agree totally, especially with nature. We, yeah. When we're talking about coming into connection with reality, we talk about the cultural aspect. Though. We talk about going to see a therapist. We talk about fixing our lives so you can be more successful with your career. But this is much more foundational. Here we're talking about coming in connection with nature itself, which people are devoid of, you know, normal urban, digitally savvy people today. They, they, they have no, they have never had an experience like this at all. So they don't even know what they're talking about. This connection with nature is so, is so whole. And this is why I will return to this idea of monism here that comes back in, in Zoroastrianism and Shaivism as well when, when we travel to Iran and India. And there's the strong connection with Peru and Mexico. I, I, I want to ask Shaheen here, is, is that what, how you dealt with Living in North America, which is so infused with this sort of dualist culture, with the separation of body mind, which you're reminded of constantly, and 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 then having these experiences, which clearly makes you a monist, which are so intensely non-dual. How, how did you experience that? Um, yeah, I think this is um, the experience of probably my last two decades. Um, of learning how to, um, yeah, be very objective about, um, yeah, basically your career and specifically like as a as an immigrant to basically to cope with the survival, to be separate from you know your emotional support, um, 
you know, um, group with your family and friends and kind of like going through the survival mode um, is also contributing to that separation somehow. And, and as a result, somehow that is your, you know, your safe space to create in a way that um, you try to bring that, you know, you know, basically oneness again between your inner world and outer world. Um, you know, it, it may be, I, what I can refer to that from a very authentic standpoint is that um, our culture, you know, like the Eastern culture at the same time, because of this history of um, like very long mysticism and, and also uh, addition of, um, let's say, some of the non-experiential um you know kind of like more religious aspects let's say like even like zoroastrianism when it becomes a religion or islam as a religion that tells you to do this or to do that or to obey versus to experience even just like deconstructing those levels it takes a while like for somebody who comes from the east you know and then and the full indulgence to the world of you know gnostic or you know the experiential approach um but what i my my experience in the west is more like the world is defined mostly in the outside world right you are specifically in north america consumerism is is all these shiny objects that you are just running after your career you know just like bragging and showing off and trying to be successful and all of these um but as you see you know, I guess the world is going to that direction that it doesn't really matter if it's East or West, like the direction for human survival is this authentic connection with self, which the self is this boundary that then you indulge yourself in a much bigger world that the world is your inner world. And that is where some of these, you know, ancient wisdom from different parts of the world actually has to come together in my perspective from a very um secular way you know a secular mystic mystic approach in a way that the, the way of mystical journey or exploration into um a balance between the inner and outer into bringing values from the inner world to the outer world and also from the outer world to the inner world in a way that like if you have a career you kind of bring that unity and integrity to you know both sides so this is an this is an actual practice so i can't say that this is west or east i think like we are all experiencing different part of this we're touching different parts of this element elephant and then we each because it's something very big you know we just learn with each other and sessions like this and talk a conversation like this shows that like we are actually going through the same path and we just like this is only happening by sharing our stories by sharing our experiences by sharing what we are um you know what we are basically seeing from you know from inside and outside and how we can kind of integrate those and you know and then basically working together and that's the way you know to kind of bring unity into the human experience uh kind of again freedom from the trauma of, you know, let's say being aligned to one lineage or to the other lineage, but freedom to the world of oneness, which doesn't really matter which lineage you're taking, taking you through that. Shaheen and Zachary, I'm curious to ask you both in your own words, why you guys think culture has wound up with such a problem with psychedelics. And we're familiar with Bard's critique, which I think is a great critique about the monism and the dualism. But I wonder if you guys have anything to add to that. I think it's because we're afraid of truth. These ecstatic states that we're dealing with when we deal with medicine. It is a process of death and rebirth, creation and destruction over and over and over again. Things get messy because the, that which is not true will be destroyed. 
Inevitably, that which is not true will be destroyed if you work with these medicines, if you get into these ecstatic states, if you tap into the absolute truth and bring more and more of that into your body and into your life. Everything which is not true will be destroyed. It will be burned on the pyre. And when you have whole cultures, whole systems, whole power structures built on lies, built on disconnection, built on an attachment to the status quo, you're going to ban everything that jeopardizes that. And the biggest threat to a disconnected status quo is medicine. It's these ecstatic states that reveal truth in a blistering way that cannot be ignored. I should just add here that that's what I'm doing my philosophy on Sudokist. We have been taught the truth resides in the logos. No, truth resides in, in human experience, mm -hmm. in directing human experience. Truth resides in the pathos. And we're terrified of that. Uh, and, and, and the sort of commercialized mass culture we're living today is terrified of that. And we, we go back to that idea that science is where truth is at. No, the ultimate truth, the absolute truth is in the human experience itself. And this is, I think this is exactly what Zachary is saying here. What I'm saying is that it's a pathical truth we're talking about because that's where truth resides. It, it resides in your body, in the truth has to be realized. in your mind. Yeah, it has to be, it has your body and your mind unified. That's where the truth resides. And then being connected with the world. And that interconnection is where truth resides. And that's a pathical truth. You will never get this kind of truth from artificial intelligence. You get even more logos and even more math soda. But that's that's the wrong place to look for truth. Mm. Yeah, and um, maybe one, one other thing that I want to add, Owen, is is I, I totally agree with what Zachary actually brought in terms of like just to take you away from truth. But at the same time, culture is a very uh, complex definition. It's kind of like a residue of people's decisions and actions you know, over time that's kind of like carried over. And sometimes you don't even know why it's working the way it's working because against the residue of actions and, um, and not always very intentional. It's not like, it's not getting revisited every time for the right purpose and for the, for the, for the right reason. But, you know, I guess one understanding and realization that I have had, and I guess this is Alexander, and I had this conversation in, in Paris too. When, when you look into the Zoroastrian pantheon, you know, the, basically the, the older Iranian religion, they were very heavily indulged into the world of shamanism and use of uh, psychedelics. They are saying that basically the way to get into this other world journey was through pharmacological intervention. It was not meditation. It was not saintliness. It was not because you deserve. It was... There, there was a tool. The tool was using these potions intentionally to get you there. But, but with this whole psychedelic renaissance that actually um, going forward in the past few years, I think there is this lesson that I'm actually learning more about and thinking more deeply about is actually the fact that, you know, Zarahustra came and, you know, basically there is based on Gotha, they're saying that Zarathustra kind of brought this caution about the use of psychedelics or the use of, you know, Homa. And, I, and as, as I think more about this, I think when, when, let's say, imagine that, again, everybody gets indulged into this world of using psychoactives. And these psychoactives, they are binding to different receptors. They are opening the different realm of truth to people. But what is the real truth? So there is, again, so at some point, then there has to be a compass in a way that, okay, which one of these um, path is the right path? You know, let's say, imagine that this, this psychedelic comes to mainstream, you know, let's say, and people start to do self-experimentation and then go more even intentionally with, you know, the reason that they want to go after after a, a, a more immense experience or to unlock their potential, whatever it is, let's say 10 years from now, then again, there is this question that where, which direction are we going? And I guess with that, that's the lesson that actually came from 4,000 years ago from the, you know, this 
protagonist Zarathustra that actually came to the pantheon of all these shamanic practices. And then he actually brought that distinction that the distinction is that the truth, that the distinction is the path of the righteous. And then how you can even define the path of righteousness, that is a question. That is something that is very deep philosophy. It's not culture anymore. It, it has to be, you have to go very directly to the, to the, to the, um, to the core of the, the philosophy and the truth to, to have that compass to guide you through your exploration of the consciousness and to the exploration of your full self. I agree here totally. The, the, what Zarathustra or Zoroaster says in the Gathas is that there's the difference between Asha, which is the constructive mindset with the right intentions, and Druj, which is a destructive mindset with all the wrong intentions. And what it warns us about is that we must have the constructive mindset. Zoroaster is not opposed to the Homa at all. It is opposed to the wrong use of these fantastic tools for humanity. And again, we're talking about intention. That's the universal one that returns in Peru, in Mexico, in Iran. They always return to the shamanic, uh, the shamanic use as the right intention. You should not pursue these things unless you got the right intention. But what opens up to if you can use these tools properly is absolute truth. And here is Zoroaster in the Gathas. 1700 before Christ in Iran agrees perfectly with Zachary just described from his experience in Peru. And this is so striking. Uh, I would just like to throw a little question here to Owen, because I know you and Raven Conley are planning to do a lot of chats on sexuality over the next few months and things like that. You're going to do a new podcast or something. You can talk about it if you like. But what is striking here is that the prohibition of psychedelics also led to the prohibition of sexuality. And I would say the problem with its dualist cultures is not sexuality itself. I never had a problem with sexuality after I had these experiences. I'm sure Sakharin and Shaheen agree. They're totally comfortable with sexuality. No, not a problem. That's one of the advantages of having had these experiences. But the problem with mainstream culture today is that it's obsessed not with sexuality. It's obsessed with the prohibition of sexuality. And, and I'm sure here, Owen, you, you, you will have an interesting connection. I'd like to hear your take on this, what, what you and Raven are going to pursue is that it's important here to see that it's precisely a culture that bans psychedelics and goes after these experiences and is obsessed with some kind of sobriety that they invent because ecstatic experiences are dangerous. Like if truth itself would be dangerous, right? They're also prohibiting sexuality at the same time. And they're basically, honestly, fucking it up to be serious about it. What would be your take on that, Owen? Since you've had, you've had the experiences, you're interested in both these two topics. Yeah, it's a it's a nice connection there. So as you say, um, Raven Connolly and I have got a new podcast in the works. It will be going out through Techno Social, but we're probably going to call it Body Politics because we want to think about these questions of the body. It's the timeless question, and it's still, like Alexander is pointing out, a real mess. I came across this great line in a book I was reading the other day um, by by a writer I recently discovered. He's a guy called Peter Gray. And he seems to be writing in the tradition of, um, of Thelema, of Aleister Crowley crossed with Western witchcraft. But he really seems on a mission to cut out the new age and to cut out the Christian legacy and provide some fertile ground here. It's really fucking interesting and electric reading him. He's very poetic. But this line was, there is no left-right political divide. There are only those who are trying to suppress the body and those who are fighting against them. And I find that to be a really interesting way to start to think politics, especially politics in the 21st century and what's going on with digital and with the arguments about locking people inside and with everything that's happening with all the debates about transgenderism, all the debate, the returns to a kind of neo-Puritanism or a neo-traditionalism that's becoming popular as well. Where Raven and I think there's an interesting angle, which, as Bard said, it, we're probably going to be beginning from sex, but it does apply to psychedelics as well. And I'm curious to hear where you guys go with this, is that since the 1960s, there's been this boom of liberation movement. And, um, and then there's, of course, been the reaction against it as well. And 
we side quite strongly with the liberation with the people should absolutely be free to play and experiment with sex and with drugs and with consciousness and with spirituality and with religion. Um, but there's dangers involved too. It's not just a lifestyle decision. And it does seem that with certainly with sex, with, <laughs> with Instagram kink is one of the ways of thinking about it, that mm -hmm. it's become a performance. A lot of this stuff, it's become, um, a performance that then becomes about being provocative and then gets reacted against. And so you end up with this culture war. And the important and the interesting questions are to begin to go, I guess this get this taps into conversations around sutra and tantra that have been familiar within our, our communities for quite a while as well, is not right or wrong, yes or no, but what are the appropriate boundaries around these things? What are the appropriate initiatory conditions? I think initiation is something that's worth thinking a lot more about, as far as I understand from the mystery cults and spiritual schools of all else. Initiation is something that has always been practiced, whether or not it's done in a ritual setting from guru to disciple or whether it's a form of self-initiation. We just did a podcast recently on Parallax with John Michael Greer, who's a, a druid, and he pointed out that actually under the Christian suppression of a lot of this stuff, for a lot of the time, initiations had to be done very secretly, just from someone writing something down, perhaps, and passing it to someone. Because if if you were caught two or more of you gathering and playing around with spirits or with drugs, you might get burned at the motherfucking stake. I, my point here is that I think Sacre is onto this. It, it's about there's a good asceticism in the sense that if you want to get to a certain state, you got to sacrifice certain things to concentrate to get there. That's the whole point with being aesthetic. It's like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because I want to pursue that. And, and here's the problem, I think, with sexuality, which ties into why we also ban psychedelics in the same process, is that we created a culture where the prohibition of these activities has become its own means. So it's like the prohibition with psychedelics means to a worship of sobriety. There is no sobriety. <laughs> Our brains are full of hormones and molecules and everything all the time anyway. They just disconnected from nature and connected from the world, which is psychedelics can help us to get through. And the same thing is the problem with sexuality. It's not sexuality itself. I just I just dropped that completely when I went through these experiences. Sexuality was a non-problem because prohibition in itself was gone. And for me, the ascetic experience was about that. But there's a bad asceticism in our culture, which is to enjoy the prohibition. And in this sense, the people will go after our sexual freedom, which there could be reasons for, and the people will go after our psychedelic freedom, and there could be reasons for that too. But they go after these things for all the wrong reasons. They go after it because they enjoy, they enjoy being these pillar saints who ban these things, who go after us who criminalize these activities and say, you must not do that. You can only do it in this very, very conformed, tiny little space and nothing outside of it because it's too dangerous for you, right? And, and none of this is true. This is, this is the biggest lie we have in society, I would say. I don't know, Zachary, to, to get where you are and with the confidence you have today, in what way did you see because you you did you did you did do the Indian thing first in a way before yeah. you before you discovered Peru in all this research, yeah right? yeah and I'm uh, it's the path of Shiva and Krishna that is my path you know I, I began the path as the ascetic of disciplining my energies disciplining my personality disciplining my lifestyle etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, until I attained a certain level of God realization you know when I could go into the breathless state easily I was like okay now what <laughs> and I got to a point on my path where in, to continue my awakening process, I was going to have to go live in a cave for a long time, or I could work with plant medicines. And the message I got from spirit is we ain't got time for that. The most, the most expedient path right now to continue your awakening, to continue your service is the medicine. And, and so, and that began my tantric phase. You know, I had the ascetic phase, the householder yogi, you know, law abiding, upright, pillar of the community, attorney for 10 years, managing partner of my law firm. Then I gave it all away to do this. Right. This tantric path. And when it came to sexuality, yeah, there was there had to be a certain disciplining of my sexual energies. 
you know, there had to be, had to give up maintenance masturbation to porn, right? Because that was junk food. Had to give up exchanging sexual energy with people where there wasn't a deep soul connection and compatibility at an energetic level because we were trading marbles energetically and it was clogging up my system, right? And so sex is always a technology of ecstasy and transcendence. Are you doing it skillfully is the question. And, you know, you can, you can have sex at a fairly low level of, and have a lot of pleasure, you know, orgasm and, you know, this, that, and the other, had a bunch of babies and they, you know, that's all its own lesson. But it can also be elevated through discipline, through discernment, through prayer and dedication of those energies to the sacramental and the divine. It can become a transcendent, ecstatic experience where just the touching of hands becomes ecstasy, where it becomes an orgasm just to touch hands, just to look in one another's eyes, where you can have this merger of being, where you have these two sons that are your individual souls coming into ecstatic merger and fusion with one another, creating this nuclear reactor of infinite energy. That's what interests me. You know, and I, I didn't get here through self abnegation. I got here through a process of discerning what is most true, what is most pleasurable, what is most real, what's most ecstatic. I had to give away lesser pleasures for the ultimate pleasure. And that's, that's the path. That was exactly my point. And you had it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what we call tantric practices here. Mm -hmm. So Islam and Christianity did one good job. They got rid of the caste system in the West. Yeah. Everybody was equal before God. But the problem with that kind of equality was that it came at the price of introducing dualism, which is a big mistake, I think, historically. Maybe we have to sort of dialectically now synthesize all these different ideas to get at something else. And, and I think opening up these doors is key. But I think it's perfect to describe psychedelic practices as tantric. And also sexual practice, when you go into the dance states, are definitely tantric. I would even say that Owen probably agrees with me that psychoanalysis is a tantric practice as well. And we often talk about in our circles that sex and drugs and psychoanalysis are now the three Western tantras. And what we mean with that is that this is this is not to be done lightheartedly. This is not to be done without the proper intentions. This has to be guided. It, 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 has, it has to take time. And like you said, Zachary, you have to sacrifice a lot of things to be able to go through these stages and get to these points where you want to get, especially if you're going to contribute and then guide others through these experiences. That's absolute key. If you have the ambition to become a shaman yourself, you're not starting a drug laboratory and just throwing things into your mouth because then you're probably going to die within two weeks or something. Mm -hmm. It takes years and it takes skillful masters like Don Howard to guide you to get there. Shaheen, in what sense, have you you've been to Iran? Have you, have you done the shak shak? No, not yet. No, yeah, we have to do it together. So we should say what that is. We should say that America has contributed richly because we know a lot about the traditions in Peru and Mexico. And, and Shaheen and I are very involved in just discovering the Iranian traditions, which are on a par with the Peruvian and the Mexican ones. But, but, but you know, it, it means going to pre-Islamic Iran. It means to going to going going back to Shaivist India to discover these traditions in India and Iran, and then maybe also have another version compared to the traditions from Peru and Mexico. And, and Shak Shak is this mountain in southern Iran outside Yast, where you walk up the hill with the Zoroastrians, and they drink literally all the way up to the hill because they, you know, they're very proud of having all the vineyards in Iran because they can drink wine and alcohol as much as they like, and the Muslims can't. So it's a bit of pissing off the Muslims going up the shock shock. But the, you go all the way up to this beautiful hill, and you get to the top, and it's clearly the time you get to the top to have a psychedelic experience. It, it's a fire temple. So Rastanism worships the fire. It's the equivalent to worshiping you know, Shiva's dick in India. It's the same thing. It's just, it's just like a living dick or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. you, you got the, the fire temple itself is the Yoni. The fire temple itself is the feminine. And inside the fire temple, there's the fire, which is the masculine. It's beautiful to see the combination. And these places are clearly designed to drink the whole mind, go through the psychedelic experience. And maybe Sean, you can tell us a little about your work in trying to find these compounds of the whole mind and, and what you want to do in introducing these elixirs coming from Iran and Central Asia as well to their overall psychedelic world. Absolutely. 
Um, you know, it's for my journey into psychopharmacology or neuropsychopharmacology, which is a very multidisciplinary area, um, and then kind of relate that into subjective experiences, which connects you into the world of mysticism, experiential, um, you know, sense of unity and God or whatever, you know, which is this, this, this bigger um, and, and all encompassing, you know, experience of, uh, of, of existences. So this is, these are like, I always, I guess I, maybe I just always have this two sides of like, as, as Zachary said, like from a lawyer to a shaman, from a scientist, you know, into a mystic. Um, so my, what my contribution at this point is actually understanding how this subjective experiences has contributed to um, different realization. Let's say, what is different a little bit about Iran, maybe I bring that as a distinction, is that we had shamanism, and then on top of a shamanism, it didn't stay as shamanism as in Mesoamerica, like Peru, or so it was shamanism. And then Zarahustra brought a very, uh, basically just like solid philosophy, you know, over the shamanism. And then the philosophy became a religion, which is kind of like a reduction from what the real meaning was. And then, and then that again changed, you know, over with the conquest of Islam, you know, of Iran, and then like basically just intrusion of another culture and language. And Iran is this like mixture of having all this kind of like disconnection from the truth, but at the same time having it inherently in you and then bring that metaphorically in your poetry, but at the same time be disconnected from the truth. And, and what I see is that like the, the contribution of these, you know, totalitarian regime is actually to kind of separate you your attention mostly from what the truth was what like basically what why iran was the birthplace of so many different religions why human in that part of the region all came with these revelations about something bigger so there have had multiple religions you know just being born in iran so i can tell you that like as i deep getting more deeper into um I call it today as Iranian, um, like a spirituality or a Iranian mystic path is that is more derived from the experience of death. So I guess if you, let's say, look into the poetry of Rumi or the poetry of Hafez, I like Hafez is actually like telling you a lot about this connection to the world of intuition. So you're always having this metaphorical use of different words that all of them are is working for everybody so you don't know like where that that's been disseminated from it's just kind of like the language doesn't belong to this current realm the language comes from just like basically from that connection to something that you can't really bring into language so that was what the the bigger contribution of of let's say poet poem puts like 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 Hafez or Rumi or Attar was but but when I just strip off everything, I guess the, the Iranian mysticism is actually coming from that experience of dying before death. This is exactly what Rumi actually, like the die before you die actually comes from. So when you die before you die, uh, I think Brian Moresco actually put this very well, that like you don't die when you die because you have experienced death before dying. And that is where you strip your 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 soul of everything that is as you say like it's just like the the sutric or this is this this um you know this this world that is just like uh the outside world let's say and um and again that has created a lot of branches over time from different you know dynasties to histories to culture and what what it stays today as what we have but but again, it's tripping that off into a philosophy that is coming from death. And, and when you get into Homa, interestingly, the compounds that was used based on my most um, 
basically up to day understanding of these subjective experiences neuro and neuropharmacology is that so the homa was indulging you into this state of like a they call it on a referenic state or basically the meaning is like this 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 is this dreamy state and the dreamy state is a is basically the state that allows you to have le- like kind of like the the a leap through consciousness so this in this dreamy state you have revelation they call it reduction so the dreamy states is where you're able to receive informa- information instantaneously you don't need to to do interpretations or like analyze through data or you know the or realization you instantaneously know the truth so this this instantaneous element is what a reduction is, is leaping through planes of consciousness that comes through this, this the, the dream world. And that is why Jung actually spends a lot of time into opening you know, the archetypes and, and like what he captures through dreams, because that is where the, the realization, the epiphanies, and what you get is coming directly from the unco- the world of unconscious. This is something that you don't know, but, and you have no access to. It's not like it doesn't matter like how long you explore in the world or even like you deep, go deep in, into yourself. It's just like you have to trust that what you go through is a co- co- collaboration between you and something bigger, which is which is the unconscious, which is the world of you know, which is the wholeness basically. So. The compounds are based on, based, again, um, there are, to me, is there a com- combination of beta carbolines, which, again, is a group of compounds that exist in Yahe or part of an ayahuasca. So these are the same compounds being used in Mesoamerica, in Peru, in, 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 in Brazil, as well as, you know, in, in Iran, that they create this the state of putting you into the dreamy states. That's where, you know, when you look into, for example, Gotha, you know, um, it, you know, let's say Yasna 30 or 31, I guess it, it tells that like the, the, the Zahusra's revelation came through a dream. So the dream is, is been, you know, referred to multiple times. And then there are words that are actually defining these subjective stairs, like star or like Khafana, which is, which is this kind of like the state of between dream and awakeness so today let's say the practice of meditation especially when you kind of like you you fall into when you're like sitting in deep meditation sometimes you you cross that path into like falling asleep but you're not really falling asleep you're present or let's say when you're waking in the middle of the night let's say to have a lucid dream when you practice lucid dreaming so lucid dreaming is exactly when you consciously meet the unconscious world so we had that practice through drinking homo, you know, and then drinking homo allows you to, to create that, again, that dreamlike state, that the dreamlike state is, is providing you the, the cap- capability to have the reductions. That the reduction is, again, that this instantaneous awareness just by being present. And that is how, you know, these... Uh, compounds work. So the beta carbolines and, you know, like again, in, 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 in ayahuasca, they mix the beta carbolines with DMT, dimethyltryptamine. But in Iran, they were mixing mostly beta carbolines with ephedrine or ephedra coming from another plant, which ephedra is mostly, is like kind of, the effect is, is amphetamine based, is very much like um, uh, MDMA is kind of like mixing MDMA with Yahe rather than DMT with Yahe. So that is that is kind of how I can kind of relate the experience of Homa to to a more understandable substance in today's world. I wish it added the MDMA is a natural drug. Most people don't know that it comes from the sassafras tree that grows in Asia. Yeah. And it's usually manufactured that way. The Chinese are slaughtering the forests of Cambodia at the moment to get sassafras trees to make MDMA in Canadian drug factories. But that's the way it works. So, so this is really fascinating. So uh, I, 
I hear the same absolute truth that Zachary just talked about. You're revealing it here. The way you describe it historically in Iran is that you say that you can only pass the, the, the Shinavat bridge once. That's when you die. The shamans can cross it many times. The definition of a Zaltar, uh, a Zoroastrian mm -hmm. shaman, is that he can cross the Shinavat bridge many times in his life. And, and this was also my experience. Zachary, do you want to mention the Vikra and, and the experience on the Vikra based on the Wachuma that you can well, go absolutely. through? Absolutely a near death experience and then you come back to life again and that's initiate that's the initiation ritual for the shavin priest essentially yeah. that's what it was yeah. and um uh, in uh in shavin they would initiate their pr priests um you know after a cycle of work with wachuma to purify yourself or you know some don howard would do a cycle of work with ayahuasca then a cycle of work with wachuma uh, then voca so you were extra purified in order to see receive the sacrament but um, it's just, it's, you know, it's this little seed. You just grind it up, mortar and pestle. And um, what the um, what they would do in Shavin is they would go into the catacombs of Shavin. They would go down into the tombs. So you would have these tombs underneath the temples. You can literally yeah. see them in Peru. I just want to add that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they would take you, lead you down into the darkness, take you down into the tombs, and they would take the priests to be initiated down there and they would put them in the darkness. They would serve them the Vilka, blow it up their nose. And then they would be given the opportunity to completely surrender to their death. And not everybody's able to do it. What happens when you, you partake in the Vilka is that you'll experience this, um, the vital energy leaving your body. You experience yourself dying. You experience all the energy draining out of your extremities and just draining away. And the invitation is to surrender, surrender, surrender. And Vilka, as a teacher plant, is teaching you where you're still hung up, where you still have attachments, where you're still afraid of death, where you still think you're mortal, right? Where, where you forgot that you're, you're deathless awareness, right? And so as you learn those lessons and as you surrender, 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 let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, you die. And when you surrender to your death, all the energy pulls down at your root chakra, runs up through the Shashumna Nadi, through your spinal column, hits your third eye, your crown, blasts up and out, one with the creator. Beautiful white light, infinite bliss, one with God. And after that experience, after you come out of it, you've died and you've been reborn. Now, not everybody's able to surrender. A lot of so there's some people the vibration of Vilka is so high, they're not even in enough re resonance with it to be able to feel it or experience it. Some people they'll surrender some, but not completely. They don't get all the way to bliss. They don't get all the way to the white light. They don't get all the way to the creator. I would say maybe 25 percent if they're lucky. May probably less get get to source. But if you're able to do it. It is the most incredible initiation you can imagine. And most most priests, they would only do it once or twice in their lifetime, right? Once you know, you know, right? Um, but yeah, that was a final initiation for the priest. And I, you know, I was honored to be empowered to serve Vilka by Don Martin. And, um, and you know, again, honor of my lifetime uh, to hold that medicine and serve that medicine. I'd, I'd tell you, it's, it's the ultimate priestly initiation of any culture. Yeah. It is. Um, yeah, my experience was that I, I died. And, and, and the first thing I realized when I hadn't died was that I was angry. <laughs> I was I was literally reborn. I was reborn, like the way you must be angry when you're born. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't want to live. It's the first reaction. Because I'm dead. I'm supposed to be dead. It's just yeah. like, and I'm back into life. And all you can experience at that state mm -hmm. is the willingness to serve. And nothing else is there. It's just the willingness to serve. And you know it be because before that happens, all you think about is the older people you leave behind when you're dying. Mm -hmm. And how you you... you how you want them to love each other and take care of each other when you're gone so they can take care of each other and they won't miss you. It is all, it was all, there was this intense feeling of intense, intense love of the very people I loved. And, and this, I think, in Iranian culture is what's called Anjuman. 
And Andrew Mann is it's the origin of all the big religions and their ambitions for the congregation, for the church, for the synagogue, for the mosque, whatever it is. But it has an origin in Zoroastrianism, and it comes from the word Anjuman. Anjuman is, is the congregation itself. It, 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 it's there before you. It's there after you're gone. And you're there to serve the Anjuman. To find your archetype, your personal type, is to serve the Anjuman. And when you've gone through this experience, it, there's nothing else left in you except this enormous eagerness to be of service. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Nothing else. Zachary, you're, you're the expert on it. I can tell the Martin is point you to it. So, but this is not the experience for every guy. It, you, you have to have done your journey. You have to have done your work. You have to get the shadows out of the way. And you can't go and knock a door or pay money or anything like that in Peru to get the experience. I was invited to have the experience. I was invited in the sense that you're one of us. You should do this, right? Yeah. And then I gladly accepted it. I, I, of course, accepted with a certain sense of terror, like, what the fuck? I'm going to die, you know? <laughs> and you are afraid of dying before you actually have the experience. Then you realize what death is. Death is a death onto a life of service. Yeah. Okay. That was my experience. So, Owen, you're the virgin here in the group. <laughs> we're just putting the seed inside of you you're gonna do you're gonna do your podcast and techno socials and parallax or whatever but you put the seed inside of you so one day you're gonna kill me <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that one day you're gonna kill me yeah it's like what you say in a relationship yeah now it's interesting because it reminds me that again in the traditions that i've read and study they talk a lot about crossing the abyss swearing the oath of the abyss and once you've been through that then your limited personality dies and you enter into a relationship with your angel and then you come back to serve and it sounds like another way of talking about exactly what you're speaking here yeah it's uh, it's beyond words, let's put it that way. But I, I can understand. You should study the shoving cultures. If you're viewing this podcast, guys, go ahead and study the shoving culture. If you get a chance to go to Shavado Altar in Peru, if you get a chance to go to Zachary especially, but but this place is so striking. And and shoving culture existed from about 3,000 years ago to about 2,000 years ago. But, 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 you know, it was before Christ, according to our calendars, right? But but it was a culture that existed for hundreds of years in peace. And it probably didn't go down because of warfare or anything. It probably went down through an earthquake. The problem with both Peru and Mexico and Iran is that if a fantastic culture goes down in these places, and then you have to wait for another one to rise, it's probably because of a massive earthquake or something like that. The Nazca people apparently disappeared the same way. We don't know how the Shaman culture went down, but we know we had it for hundreds of years. And since it is the one culture in history that had the longest period of peace, it's the one we should really study carefully. Mm -hmm. And and apparently here, psychedelics was central to the culture. It's it's very hard to imagine coming from a Western culture where we we've been taught that all these things should be prohibited and locked up and they're dangerous, and we're supposed to celebrate some kind of sobriety, which leaves us with a very sort of naked state of, of just fighting against others as atoms fighting each other in a society, the kind of society we have today. This is the total opposite of that. This is, is a deeply congregational community we're talking about. And I wish one day we can get there. Let, let's start with calling these practices tantric and introduce them slowly and, and have people, some people of us make it, make the journey first and see where that heads and see where we can go with that. But I'm just glad we're having this conversation tonight. And yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to hearing about these different experiences, the similarities between the Iranian, the Indian, and the Mexican Peruvian traditions here. It's fantastic. It's cold. Yeah, one, one addition I think that I um, came to my mind was another, uh, some of the psychedelics, specifically the contribution that they have is um to the process of unlearning so i guess unlearning is is doesn't come naturally to human being because we are prone to develop uh habits and the habits is a way of doing things you now repeatedly in a way that you are more comfortable with and 
And then when then you're creating, basically you're creating plasticity around doing that thing always the same. And most of the cultures and, and systems, they are taking advantage of that because people are not, you know, like re <clears throat> reconsidering things, you knowing doing in a very different way because of like feeling insecure or um, all the risks, you know, that it brings to their lives. But again, pharmacologically, specifically from a sigma one receptor type. So what happens is that you have this chance to electrophysiologically immediately, you know, like dissociate your thoughts and learning from one way of thoughts and then replace that with a new, new, you know, kind of learning and thoughts. And this process is exactly the, the hero's journey. Again, the hero's journey, you unlearn, you go through the abyss and then you learn and you come back. And then this fractals happens every time. So the hero's journey is a circle because learning and unlearning is a circle. And that is also contributing to how who we are, and then we die, and then we re get reborn. We die, and we get reborn. As it's not this mundane one, you know, path of life that you just starts from one location and then you end it um, somewhere else. You just like you die, and then you recreate yourself multiple times. So maybe then to add to that, if this is then the last question of our session here. We could talk forever. I, I could just talk to you guys for like ever. But uh, I pass it on to Zachary. Um, can I ask you very straightforwardly, what is to be expected of you before you go on a pilgrimage with Zachary Adama to Peru or Mexico? You have to be willing to die to yourself and be reborn. Period. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm sitting here in the darkness looking like a freak or a ghost or something like that. But I, Owen just said that this, this is perfect for how I put Alexander in the darkness tonight for this conversation. So <laughs> I've enjoyed it immensely. How about you, Owen? Any any last comments from you? Technosocial comments? Well, Joe, I've been left. I actually had a final question myself, which goes off. And a slight tangent, but I would let's answer it maybe quickly and poetically because we've got some shamans and visionaries here, I suppose. Is what's your sense for the future? Thackeray. It's all a choice. It's all a choice. You know, last week. I'll just share some of my personal journey. Last week, um, I was having a, a delivery from Peru of some medicine with chuma powder. Got intercepted uh, by the government, and they did a controlled delivery and delivered the package. And then I had three federal agents at my door who just came with a search warrant, who searched my house, took my sacrament. They took, they took my wachuma, and they took some mushrooms I had. I don't have anything inorganic in this house, right? I just have basic earth medicines in my lineage. And yeah, they took my medicines. And who knows what's going to happen, right? You know, they may try to prosecute me. They may try to jail me. They try may try to do all sorts of find me. You know, they may try to do all sorts of things. And then yesterday in Louisville, 45 minutes from my house, there was a mass shooting. So we're in this situation where we've criminalized the medicine and we're prosecuting the medicine carriers as we are on the brink of World War III and as we're actively in an ecological collapse. So I don't know what's going to happen. I know I'm going to fight like hell to the day I die for the good of all. I know I'm going to fight like hell to the day I die for the right practice my faith. And I, we actually started as a result of that. We, after Parker passed, we started the church that we had been dreaming of that came to me in a, a ceremony, the infinite way. That's the name of the church. And it's sort of a pan non-dual tantric church. Meditation, pram, pranayama, you know, and uh, medicine, soma. And we're focusing on these practices that help you achieve ecstasy, that help you achieve healing, that help you to connect with truth, and then the practices of self-cultivation that help you integrate them on a daily basis. 
to give you the framework for integrating infinity into form. And so we set up that church. It is now up and going. And I'm the head minister. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm here to, to spread the tantric faith. I'm here to serve the good of all. Day I die. Love you, brother. I love you, Sue. Infinitely. Amen. So, hey, if anything to add, that question, yeah, I mean, your sense very, of the future. Yeah, my sense of the future is the collapse of inauthenticity. You know, I don't think that the inauthentic systems is going to survive. You know, we we are going to dive deeper into this interconnected sense of um unity that we have from the east to the west from the poor to the rich and from all these like um you know dichotomic you know values so the way forward for us as a human being is to leave our truth and and i um yeah and as i learn and i go forward i would love to contribute to that realness doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's basically just like whatever that I can serve to, to the path of truth, you know, to, um, to, to make our, our, our life experience a real, a real experience of, of who we are. You know, this is, I think this is going to be all encompassing. It doesn't matter if there, there are systems or governments or uh, superpowers, you know, just like this is going to collapse if we are, connect we can continue to go the way that we go and then we need to be ready to create systems that are all encompassing you know that are bringing our wholeness experience together and define us as as human beings that we are living together so i think like again the experience is like a little bit mixed up but i am as i as i Zachary said i'm here to serve in my all best ways and to just connect the dots as much as I can. Thank you. And Zachary, keep us informed. I will. Yeah. Keep and us informed of, where you're going with, with legally and, and with yeah. authorities. And, right? You know, I had a, I had a hard few days, honestly. You know, yeah. uh, I had a hard few days of letting go of some remaining attachments to what will people think and some. Uh, I'd sort of been keeping my medicine career and my legal career separate, right? And what I find I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, in the Zoroastrian tradition, we have a word for a guy like you. <laughs> this is the guy who stands up to truth no matter what. Absolutely. And he stands out in an inauthentic society. The name for him is Sociant. Hmm. Sociant. Sociant. You personify the Sociant. It's the origin of the concept of the Messiah, the Jews inherited from Zoroastrians. Yeah. And this happened right on, right around Good Friday. <laughs> the irony, right? <laughs> the irony. But yes. uh, I, I am resolved, like I said, to the fight to the day that I die. I die to to practice my faith. I will die fighting in jail if I have to. I am committed to being completely unwavering. I'm protected by the First Amendment. I'm protected by the uh, Freedom of Religion Restoration Act, and. You know, I've done nothing wrong but practice my faith and try to serve the healing of this planet. Keep us informed and, and please know that we stand by you completely in this. Appreciate that, brother. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, man. Owen, oh, over to you. Mm-hmm. You're back with Tech the Social with a fantastic quartet today. So I'm, I'm very pleased with this conversation. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Tech the Social is back with a vengeance. What an episode to, to get things moving again. I'm so grateful to you three. And uh, it's fun to be a guest on the Alexander Bard show for once. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for um, kind of initiating this, Alexander. It's, it's always humbling to learn from you, to use your, and we have a word I want to share with you. We have a word called birarari or birarar, which means like this being impatient because of love and i always like when i see you you're that that i see that impatience that just like just comes after like outside you and that's so um elevating and that's so refreshing thank you beautiful should we wrap up guys alexander do you want a last word 
Or should we wrap? No, up? no, I, no, I'm I'm just totally fine. That there, there, there's been quite a few magical last words here already. So I'm totally fine with this conversation. Let's let's keep the conversation going. Let's put it that way. And the fact that we're now discovering these connections between the between the Mesoamerican traditions and, and Peru, especially, and with Iran, I think is fantastic. I, I wanted to open this door. And I think we gotta put a lot of guys out there on fire about pursuing further research into these topics. Definitely. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, gentlemen, let's have a wrap. Let's have a wrap. Let's call it a wrap. Let's yeah. have a wrap. I'm hungry. Ciao. Okay. And guys, see you, see you soon. See you all soon. See you all soon. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Oh, well, thanks for having us. Thank yes, you. Absolutely. Pleasure talking to you.